Ever since men learned to make and use tools, he has left behind him indestructible evidence of how he lived and what he did. These are the raw materials of archaeology, and they are the foundation stones of history. These are the marks of man. across 2,600 years of history as clearly as if they had been spoken and written yesterday. The despotic power they reveal is preserved for us on this clay prism, written by his own scribes and in his own lifetime. It is known as the Annals of Sennacherib. It's one of the three sensational archaeological finds that enable us to reconstruct the story of Hezekiah's water tunnel. This prism was found in ancient Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and is now on public display in faraway Chicago at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. The prism is written in the ancient language known as Akkadian. The decipherment and translation of this kind of writing is a wonderful story in itself, one that we might tell at some other time. But now we're interested in a particular passage. Sennacherib relates in his own words the story of a war he fought against one Hezekiah, king of Judah, a name previously known only from biblical references. You can imagine the sensation this find created among historians and scholars holding every shade of interest in the scriptures. The second great find is also in a museum. To look at it, we have to move to Istanbul. This fable city stands beside the Bosphorus, where one can stand with his feet in Europe and look right across the water to Asia. Until World War I, this was the capital of the Turkish Empire. And many curiosities found their way here to the Turkish Museum of the Ancient Orient. In the year 1880, an Arab boy found this stone inscription while playing in a tunnel near Jerusalem. The language and alphabet tie it directly to the time of Hezekiah. We'll quote from that inscription, too, when the time comes. Now we move from Istanbul down to the Palestine Archaeological Museum at Jerusalem. Here, one of the prized exhibits is this relief, a plaster cast of the original, which was also found at Nineveh. It describes the attack on one of Hezekiah's cities. The inscription says, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of the land of Asher on the Nimidu chair, and the booty of the city of Lachish before him passed. So far, we have Sennacherib's prism, the inscribed slab, and the relief discovered at Nineveh. We also have the traditional account of Sennacherib's invasion of Judah, as told in the Bible. Now, with this information, we can take the pointer of this time chart and move back leaving the present day of television and atomic power, back before the discovery of America, back before the Crusades, before the birth of Christ, to a time when Rome, mighty Rome, was a one-horse village. And we stop at 701 B.C. and find ourselves amid a fantastic series of events in a world far smaller than ours and quite different from the world in which we live. In this small world, the empire of Assyria was huge, aggressive, ruthless, and Sennacherib, who was a firm believer in force and terror, came to the Assyrian throne in 705 BC here at Nineveh. Now, if you look carefully down here, you'll see the tiny kingdom of Judah with its capital, Jerusalem. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, 
is a man with problems, problems that have a very modern ring. He was worried about national defense, about water supplies, and about taxes. And the tribute he was paying to Assyria was painfully high, but he had seen too many small kingdoms rubbed out in fire and blood to believe that he was buying any real security. Hezekiah began quietly angling for an alliance with Egypt. And as soon as he had the promise of Egyptian support, he stopped the tribute. Sennacherib struck back at him in 701 BC. The best account of Hezekiah's preparations to be found in the Old Testament books, Kings and Chronicles. And here it says, he raised the walls and extended them and led water within the walls. And then here it says, he closed the upper outlets of the waters of Gihon and directed them down to the west side of the city of David. Well, that sounds simple. But it makes no apparent sense at our first sight of Jerusalem. There's the Gihon Spring, way down in the Kidron Valley, with the walls of the city spread across the hilltops far above. Hezekiah obviously didn't lead water up that hillside to those walls. Right away, we're faced with a problem of the kind that archaeology attempts to solve. Entering the city through the Damascus Gate, we begin to see what the first archaeologists saw during the early 19th century. A medieval city, strange indeed to Western eyes, but as local scholars can tell us, most certainly built by Turks after they expelled the Crusaders. Up in the temple area, older marks of man crop up above the surface. Many cities have covered this site, a whole series of them. The Crusader city, the Roman trading center, the city of Herod where Jesus died, the Greek city of Alexander and his successors, the city restored after the Babylonian captivity, the cities of Hezekiah, of Solomon, and of David, and of the Jebusites before them. And now it's the city the Muslims call El Quds, the Holy One. <laughs> dome in the distance is called the Dome of the Rock. It houses a place venerated by Muhammad himself as a particularly holy shrine. The dome has been rebuilt and resurfaced with anodized aluminum. Otherwise, the appearance has changed little since it was built. Muslim sources say that the dome is the earliest surviving example of Arabic architecture. Its design follows that of the original Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which stood in the nearby built-up area. In Jerusalem, it's always just a step from the deepest reverence to the liveliest commercialism. The purchase of a few loaves of bread commands undivided attention of buyer and seller. Swarms of tradesmen cater to swarms of townspeople and pilgrims. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, traditionally the burial place of Jesus, reminds us that Jerusalem stirs the imagination of Christians as does no other spot on earth. The steel shoring was erected by the British to hold the structure up until it can be rebuilt. This is the second church of the Holy Sepulchre. The original fell into ruins and was replaced by the Crusaders. A feeling of closeness to the events of Jesus' life draws Christians of every denomination to the old city. But archaeologists tell us that the streets where Christ walked are buried under as much as 60 feet of rubble and we must go back yet another 700 years to find the remains of Hezekiah's city. The areas around the Dome of the Rock have been identified by continuous historical records as the site of the Temple of Solomon. The temple was part of Hezekiah's city, but where was the rest of it? We know that the Turkish Emperor, Suleiman the Magnificent, built these walls after he captured the city in 1517. Archaeologists have concentrated their search outside the present walls, relying on biblical statements that the city was close to the Gion Spring. As we look back toward Jerusalem, we see the temple area on top of the hill. Hezekiah's Jerusalem covered the bare hillside almost to the bottom of the valley, 
on both sides of the excavation, which was made by archaeologists. The work at this site is under the direction of Dr. Kathleen Kenyon of London University. This dig settled all questions as to the location of the city walls in Hezekiah's time. Dr. Siegfried Horn of Andrews University, who has devoted many years to the archaeology of Palestine, leads us up along the edge of the trench and explains some of the findings. We are standing now at the lower end of the main trench of the excavations of the last two seasons. As you can see, Ms. Kenyon started to excavate just above the uh, Gaihon well and drove her trench through all the way to the crest of the mountain. We thought that up on the top of this hill the uh, Jebusite wall was located with the Tower of David, but her excavations corrected this because she found the actual walls of the period down here at the slope of this uh, uh, mountain. Right here we can see how archaeology fills in points on which the written history is silent. This helps us understand statements that were perfectly clear to the people who wrote the Bible and knew the city as it was then. Dr. Horn is walking on the foundations of the walls that were standing when David captured the city from the Jebusites. You can see here the wall of uh, 20 or more feet thickness and another one of about seven feet uh, width. Dr. Horn was personally briefed on this site by Miss Kenyon. Was this standing in Hezekiah's day? Uh, this wall definitely was the wall that was uh, in existence during that time. These sketches show the walled city of Jerusalem as it is today and as it was 2,600 years ago in the time of Hezekiah. Of course, the picture of the ancient city can't be entirely accurate because the artist has had to fill in between the points that have been definitely located by the archaeologists. On the present city, you see the wall on top of the hill, the dome of the rock, the pool of Siloam. We'll see more of this place in a moment. And here in the Kidron Valley, a blacktop road. The Guyon Spring is right here, 15 feet underground and protected by a stone spring house. Around the ancient city, we see the wall found by Miss Kenyon, the temple built by King Solomon. There is no pool of Siloam. There's a brook and a dirt trail in the valley. The Guyon Spring is at or near the surface. This is the city Hezekiah prepared to defend against Sennacherib. Hezekiah began to prepare the city for a siege. He set to work resolutely, built up all the wall that was broken down, and raised towers upon it. And outside it, he raised another wall. Now let's keep these two spots definitely in mind, here and here. Hezekiah must already have been busy on his water project. Above the Gihon Spring, this hill, called Ophel, rises sharply to a height of 200 feet. Dividing Ophel from Zion, the next hill to the west, is the shallow draw called the Tyropean Valley. That white minaret is at the point we noted on the sketch, just 1,200 feet in a straight line from the Gihon. Today, the minaret overlooks an important water source in daily use by residents of the neighborhood. At this point, now the pool of Siloam, Hezekiah started a crew tunneling straight toward the Gihon Spring. And at the spring, another crew started digging the other way. A tunnel through this hill had to be made with hand tools. Dr. Horn describes the results. Now we have come down from the main trench of Miss Kenyon's excavation where I showed you the uh, walls of the Hebrew kings and also the earlier ones of the Jebusites. We are standing now on the stairway of the, uh, uh, which leads down to the Gaihon Spring where the main water supply of the city is located and where also Hezekiah's uh, tunnel begins. This uh, uh, ancient uh, spring is right in a cave and we, I'll lead you down to it now. 
Hezekiah had several reasons for digging his tunnel. He planned with his officers and mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. The only way to stop the Gihon was to provide another outlet. This was perfectly sound thinking from the military standpoint. Hezekiah and all his people understood the scarcity and value of water in his land. An army big enough to storm Jerusalem would be in trouble, where water was scarce. In 2 Chronicles, we are told, a great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brooks that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Why indeed? And Hezekiah had other and stronger reasons for stopping the Gaiha. Dr. Horn explains one of them. Uh, this is an original cave, uh, probably not made, although it may have been enlarged. The western end of it begins the Jebusite tunnel, which Jebusite cut in the rock uh, centuries before David took the city, and naturally centuries before Hezekiah then utilized it for as part of his tunnel. The Jebusites were a clan of the Canaanites. When David led his army against Jerusalem, they taunted him, saying, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off. Evidently, David knew of this ancient tunnel, for he said that day, Whoever would smite the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind. Right at the end of the Jebusite tunnel, there is a natural cave, and at the roof of the cave, is a perpendicular shaft which was most probably used by David soldier to catch the city. Hezekiah plugged the Jebusite shaft and began his new tunnel with the idea of leading a plentiful water supply inside the city's fortifications so that it could withstand a prolonged siege. The rock is a soft limestone but every cubic inch had to be hacked out by hand. We can easily imagine the flickering torchlight, a muscular axe man working at desperate speed, and a line of half-naked men passing baskets of loosened rock from hand to hand. We don't know how long it took them to dig their tunnel, but by working several shifts around the clock, they could have completed it in six months or less. Let's leave these tunnelers hard at work under their hill at Jerusalem and follow Sennacherib's offensive. The Assyrian emperor advanced into Palestine along this age-old pathway of invasion. Passed through subject cities and probably picked up levies of troops along the way. Now Stonewall Jackson could hardly have bettered the strategy of Sennacherib or carried it out with more force and energy and speed. The first thing he did was drive straight down the coast here to concentrate with full force upon the Egyptian field army. As far as we know, the Egyptian army did not stop running until it reached the Nile. And with this annoyance eliminated, Sennacherib turned toward Hezekiah. Now the valleys leading up toward Jerusalem were guarded by Judean fortress cities, Libna, Lachish, Debir. Sennacherib began a systematic destruction. He took Debir, moved on to Lachish. And as for Hezekiah, he had the unpleasant choice of coming down from the mountains and being destroyed in the open, or remaining safely in Jerusalem and seeing his cities destroyed one by one and all the approaches to Jerusalem laid bare. What happened at Lachish is shown on the relief. The Assyrians piled earth against the walls to make ramps for their battering rams so as to avoid the stone foundations and reach the mud brick upper walls. The rams smash away at the battlements as the Judeans fight back as best they can with arrows, rocks, and firebrands. The Assyrian archers try to pick off the Judean defenders. Out of these stiff formal carvings leaps a story of desperate men fighting amid a wild confusion of smoke, shouts, swishing arrows, screams, curses, the crash of falling masonry, and the measured thumping of the rams. Now the city has fallen. 
files of captives come forth, stunned at the loss of their homes. And referring to his way with the 46 cities he captured, Sennacherib says, I drove out 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, big and small cattle without counting, and considered them booty. The Assyrian methods were designed to break the spirit of resistance. The captives are headed for exile in faraway lands. The callous hand of Assyrian slavery falls on women and on children of tender years. Potential troublemakers are singled out to serve as warnings to would-be rebels. Expressionless soldiers, made efficient by practice, break their legs at the knees leaving them to die or live on as hopeless cripples, while others are beheaded out of hand. Second Kings tells us, And Hezekiah sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. Was Hezekiah's offer an admission that he was beaten? Or was it an attempt to play for time? We don't know. The tunnel under the hill of Ophel suggests a plausible answer. 150 feet below the surface, the workmen were struggling to complete what must have been a frustrating job. Archaeologists explored and mapped every inch of the tunnel. The rocks tell a story of prodigious labor, carried on in spite of what modern engineers would call incredible bungling, both in planning and supervising the job. The man who rediscovered the tunnel in 1838 was Edward Robinson, an American Bible scholar. He wrote, having measured the external distance, 1,200 feet, we concluded that as we had already entered 800 feet from the lower end, there could now remain not over four or 500 feet. We entered. There are here many turns and zigzags. In several places, workmen had cut straight forward for some distance, and then leaving this, had begun again further back at a different angle. The way seemed interminably long. But at length, having measured 950 feet, we arrived at our former mark, and that makes it 550 feet longer than the direct distance. The joining of the tunnels was commemorated by the inscribed slab that we saw in the Istanbul Museum, which was removed from this spot. It says, while the workmen were still wielding axes, each man toward his fellow, and while there were still three cubits to be cut through, there was heard the voice of a workman calling to his fellow, for there was an overlap in the rock to the right and the left. And when the tunnel was driven through, the quarrymen hewed the rock, each man toward his fellow, axe against axe, and the water flowed from the spring toward the reservoir for 1,200 cubits. And the height of the rock above the heads of the quarrymen was 100 cubits. Water flowing through the hill to a large reservoir inside his walls, Hezekiah had solved both his water problem and a major defense problem at one stroke. The city could not be compelled to surrender because of lack of water. In cutting the tunnel, the party at the lower end started much too high. They had to lower the level of the floor several feet after they discovered their mistake. A plan of the tunnel tells its own story of uncertainty and doubt. When the engineers realized that the tunnel was going to be several hundred feet longer than necessary, they cut a shaft to the surface, possibly to orient themselves. The two ends of the tunnel failed to make connection by about 98 feet. But the workmen heard each other's axes, and so they brought the two ends of the tunnel together. What was Sennacherib doing all this time? He was methodically destroying Hezekiah's western defense network. And he demanded 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold at the price of peace. Rather than to leave the outlying cities to Sennacherib's mercy, Hezekiah, second kings, Hezekiah sent him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. But apparently it wasn't enough. And Sennacherib sent part of his army to harass Jerusalem. 
these fruits climbed into the stony, arid hills and spread out right where we are now, facing the hill where Jerusalem then stood. Looking the other way from Ophel, we see where the Assyrians camp. Sennacherib wrote, Hezekiah I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthwork in order to molest those who were leaving his city gates. The Syrian threats volleyed across the Kidron, and the little city, clinging to what are now the barren slopes of Ophel, declined to surrender. And here a memorable dialogue was recorded. The Assyrian spokesman, standing right here, called out to the people on the walls, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, On what are you relying that you stand siege in Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that he may give you over to die by famine and by thirst when he tells you the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? The people on the walls knew that the Assyrian was wrong about thirst at least, for in their water tunnel they had a secret weapon. Meantime, Sennacherib left Lakish began to besiege Libna. He drafted great numbers of laborers to build earth ramps and to collect rocks and timbers and to assist his combat troops. Then suddenly, a large part of this multitude died. Today we might suspect that an epidemic had struck the host of Sennacherib. The Judeans wrote that the Lord had saved them the Assyrians believed that Sennacherib's gods had punished him. At any rate, Judah survived the war and lived to see Assyria destroyed. The years went by. Hezekiah's walls disappeared from the pool of Siloam. But every day the women gathered to wash their clothes, exchange their gossip, and fill their water jars in the cool recess of the tunnel. And the connection between this pool and the Gihon Spring gradually faded from human memory. Hezekiah's name and bits of his story survived only in scriptures. His tunnel was forgotten. The city he lived in changed beyond recognition. Then, archaeology steps in. And suddenly, the marks of man bring King Hezekiah to life. A human being burdened with responsibilities in a dangerous world. A man who felt thirst and feared captivity. And surrounded by dangers, he accepted fearful risks and he led his little nation out of the clutches of one of the most frightful tyrannies known to history. <laughs>